Hey everybody, and welcome back to another amazing episode of the best darn show on the internet, The Oversharing Show. Today is part two of our show summary for newbies, and we also are going to be finishing the top 10 oversharing tenets. So stay tuned. This is episode 100, which is part two. Part one of this series is episode 99. So go check that out and uh, enjoy the show. All right. So the next tenant that we're going to cover here in the overshare top 10 tenants. What's that? You keep saying an N. Oh, tenant. Go, you say it. Tenant. Tenant? Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, I'm, I'm like... I'm part white trash, you know what I mean? So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I was talking about Are that. you a landlord? Because that's when you have tenants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. Tenant. Whatever. Tenant, say it however. I mean, I, you know, it's funny because I went to Catholic schooling uh, up until ninth grade. So you'd think I would uh, but again, I, I you get the slang and the you know, it's funny because there's things that I say. And then I think about them and I'm like, that doesn't make sense. It's, they're just like little sayings or way that you say things. I'll think of it if it comes up. Uh, but it doesn't stop me from following the golden rule, which is the next tenet. It's kind of like, what would Jesus do, isn't it? Yeah, WWJD, what would mm-hmm. Jesus do? And, um, you know, it's funny when that whole movement was huge and everybody was wearing their bracelets. Right. I was kind of like... No, I was like hating on it, you know, I'm like these people. Um, but now I, I, I think it's because I was more of my agnostic phase, I guess, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really know, you know, I thought the people were just being silly and they were like under mind control, which could possibly be true. But yeah. now I see the greater beauty of this whole message, uh, because if you just at the core, if you just say, what would Jesus do and live according to that? As long as you had a your own understanding of the path of Jesus in that life, and you you could uh, get the knowing of it, right? The internal knowing, like we talk about. I feel like that's all you need, and that's really what this tenet is all about. In my Absolutely, opinion. it's funny that you we talked about what would Jesus do because I kind of, I mean, I remember vaguely about that coming about. Um. But I don't, it's funny because even though I was probably growing up in church and everything, I, I wasn't really, um, I, I mean, I was like, okay, that's cool. But like, I didn't wear the bracelet or I didn't, you know what I mean? I didn't, I just was like, oh, I guess people are, you know, into that, you know, I was like, I guess that's cool. <laughs> but I never, like, I never had a bracelet or anything like that. You, you seem to be like me, like you're not, you're kind of resistant to fads. I'm kind of like anti-fads yeah. fads, or unless I start the fad myself. And then uh, sometimes I even, even in the past more than now, I might have more of an understanding, but in the past I would kind of get disgusted by it. Um, I would even start when I was in the Marine Corps, I would start these sayings that I would say all the time. And then everybody would start saying them. Uh, and after a while I was just like, oh man, but now I yeah. realize the power of that. <laughs> Nicknames that I give people, people would use them. Yeah. Like when I used to work, um, you know, in the corporate world and I'd give somebody a nickname, other people would start using that. Like I had a, a friend named Jason at work and his last name starts with a K. But one time he like sent me an email from his personal email and it started with K. It started with K Jason. It's a K Jason. So then I just started calling him KJ. And then everybody started calling him, like other people started calling him Cage. Yeah, it's funny how that happens. I'll, it's just like other names too. This is funny. I, I warn people sometimes, well, you know, whatever, my past life when I hung out more, uh, I would be like, yo, just be careful. Like, if you, I mean, it's cool if we like bust balls, but I might give you a nickname that like sticks forever and I won't even mean to. <laughs> yeah. And then I changed it to Cage. Uh, like I modif- I kept modifying it. Johnny Later Cage. on, we started to call him Little Buddy. <laughs> I think like that was that another one? friend who gave him that nickname. Little Buddy. It was like a, it was like kind of a derogatory because like we, we had this little group of, you know, people that was like, 
we like looked down on other people at work and then we'd see them pass by and then we'd look at each other and be like, there's your little buddy over there. So then we started calling Jason <laughs> our little buddy. Oh, that's funny. Oh. And I didn't even mean it that way, but that's how it ended up. That's hilarious. Oh my god. Karen's running their little click, the mean girls and boys. Oh my lord. Uh yeah, we would we'd do that too, or another saying It was that, guys. It was mostly guys and yeah. me. Yeah, that sounds like dude behavior. That uh we had this thing we would do all the time. We still kind of do it too, where we'd be like, Oh, is that that's your father? You know, like if we saw somebody that was funny, like, oh, that's your uncle or whatever, you know, what, what's your cousin doing? Like say we're walking around the store or, you know, at, in Atlantic city somewhere. And there was some guy that just was, I don't know, looked rough or just looked like he was on drugs or whatever. Like what's your cousin doing here? Especially to Dwayne. Cause <laughs> a lot of us that hung out would have like white skin and he's from Barbados. So you had darker skin. So like, what's your, what's your dad doing over there? Your cousin. You know? <laughs> Fuck you, man. <laughs> he'd get us too, though. Cause there's still a lot of crazy white people out there. So he'd be like, Oh, is that your fucking uncle over there? So. That's funny, but we digress. Anyway, the the golden rule, we've described it to be kind of like natural law, some other synonyms, you know, natural law and, um, you know, karmic law. And we've talked about how um, Jesus talked about, you know, loving God, loving people like that's the main, you know, command his, com- you know, his favorite commandment is love God, love people, broke, you know, boiled down. But we've always talked about how you can't do that unless you love yourself first. You can't, how can you love someone else if you don't know how to love yourself first? So um, it's, it's like that. Again, we talked about this before, but putting on that, um, when you're on a plane and they tell you if the, if the masks fall from, you know, the oxygen mask falls from the sky. <laughs> 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 Put it on yourself first before you put it on someone else. It's it's kind of like that. Um, you you need to first be self sufficient, be self loving, self uh, help yourself first, and then you'll know how to help others. Um, so that's uh, some of the stuff that's kind of related to the golden rule, and I always also think about. I think Aaron Abke talks about this, maybe Bill Donahue, but how there's only one power and um, it's this energetic force of love. That's the one, that's the one power that, that is, that is. And, you know, you've heard the term in the Bible, God is love. Well, that's, that's what it is. Um, That's the powerful force. The people will say, oh, but what about hate or what about, you know, people who um, are not loving people. Well, the way I've heard it described is that they are just, um, they have a misunderstanding of love and they don't understand or comprehend it. So it's like um, just a lack of knowledge. So you have love and then you have its misunderstanding. That's, but, but the only power is love. So the people who aren't being loving, it's just like they're little children who don't understand or comprehend it. And you wouldn't, you know, be upset at a little child who's crying and upset for not understanding something. You would just, when you see something like that in the world, look at them as a little child, a little spiritual child. They don't know better. And you don't know how far away, sorry, how far on the path on their journey they are. So um, that's where you can be compassionate, have non-judgment toward them. But again, you'd have to learn to do that for yourself first, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's really what self-love is, is to not judge yourself or whenever you do something to be easy or even have love for yourself, no matter what it is, and to look at yourself through the same lens that you just described to look at other people also to look at yourself like that and to know that even though you think you know how you live uh 
you think you know how you should live and you think you have this idea of a behavior that you should mold yourself to, that sometimes you're, you're going to fall short of that expectation. And a lot of times these expectations are laid down by systems of control when we were younger, you know, our parents, which again, it's not a bad thing. They have to instill some kind of control on us. You know, when it's just running around into the, you know, being like big daddy. Remember that movie, Adam Sandler movie, big daddy. He just like, oh, I he, forgot about he, would, that one. he would just cover his, you know, basically Adam Sandler. Um, this lady tells him that he has a kid. I think that's the way the story goes, but it ends up, it's not his kid, but he tries to take care of him. And I think he's like, what, six years old or something. So he just lets him do whatever he wants. He doesn't have to take a bath or any of that. And you see all the negative consequences. So of course you need some kind of control. But what I'm talking about is, uh, you know, like the schooling and the religion and stuff and the leaders that we look to and look to for our validation. And we kind of get trained that way. And then we have this negative self-talk and that is a result of all that that we can carry on throughout our whole Guilt, life. Shame of, of things that you don't really have to be guilty or shameful about. And they directly control your actions. It's so mind blowing. You know, people do things compulsively, like cutting the lawn, for example. You know, I, I uh, at my parents' house, we had some neighbors that were, you know, really cool people, but they were super on top of their lawns. Like this one guy who cut his lawn every few days and he'd blow it out every day and it's always had to be perfect. Now, maybe this somehow is tied to his sense of worth. You know, I have to have this great lawn. Everyone's got to look at it. It's got to be great or else I fall short. Uh, but it's the same way for anything, um, any kind of compulsive behavior, or any kind, even regular behavior that we do. I think it's, it could be caused by this negative self-talk. And when we wander around like that, just kind of, being a slave to our own brain and uh, being affected so much by the self-talk. I think that's when we're in like a dream state and really like we talked about being in the present moment, the first tenant tenant is um, it's like uh, really the key to that, to be in the present moment, because then you're out of the dream. You're here, you're in reality, you're not lost in the future or the past thinking. And I feel like, as you do that and as you start to be okay with your actions and actually start to love what you do, even whatever you do, if it falls short, you just look at it. Like we said, like, you know, maybe that's just something I had to do. I had to do it till I was done. Uh, it's fine because I think once you start to do that and accept your own actions, then there is less shame in the spiral. You know, you could break out of it because if it is shame, that's causing the spiral. If you love yourself, just like we said before, um, the law of one, and I think we said this last week too, negative entity beings, when you show them love and light, they just go away. Well, could it be the same with self negative self talk? If you're just like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the social gathering that's going on and I'm going to have a few drinks and have a good time. And you wake up the next day with a headache and drink some water and you're like, you know what? I had a great time. It was perfect. Exactly what I needed to do while I was out there. I was letting out stress, letting out tension. I'm so glad I did that, right? That's one way to look at it. Or you could wake up in the morning with a headache and be like, oh man, I drank too much. Why did I do that? This is bad for my health. You know, I, I might, what did people think about me? What did I say? And you're just in this negative spiral. Now take these two different viewpoints or frames of mind and put them into the same person uh, or, you know, the same kind of person throughout the day. Like how's it going to affect, you know, if you had a side-by-side -side comparison? Uh, I think, so I think just that, positive view of your own self and your own actions really is what self-love is about and getting to know yourself. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do. So later I'm going to go smoke crack and I'm going to be excited about it now. <laughs> but, um, I, I think really, again, it's like a balance, right? Um, but I feel like that's the key, the present moment, the one, and then just to, to start to accept your own actions, no matter what they are, just to know that everything is part of your path. You know, I was listening, there's this song, it's a more modern song called uh, uh, Feel This Moment. No, it's, it's by Cruella, and it's called Alive. That's what it is. It's like a house song. And, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. That is a beautiful song. But there's a song by Avicii. It's called Wake Me Up. There it is. A song by Avicii called Wake Me Up. And um, maybe I'll look up the lyrics because I can't quite remember. But it, it's Post basically like that. When you do. 
you know, I didn't, it, he's basically saying like, I just, I woke up, I realized that everything that I was doing was part of my path kind of thing. Like, oh, this is, you know, I didn't even realize this was part of what I had to do. So all the terrible things that you think you do, all the nasty secrets that you have about yourself where you think people, if they found out, would think you're terrible. Well, it's like, no, you, you look at that and you see it's because of whatever happened in your life. That's uh, the way you look at it. And that's why you have these tendencies and compulsions and you start to accept them and love them. And I feel like they lose their grip on you. Yeah. But that's in, in closing of all that nice little rant that I did my oversharing. Uh, I feel like that's really what following the golden rule is. That is the essence of loving yourself. So you can also love other people in the same way. So then you could take the view front and back. If something happens outside, somebody does something in front of you, they cut you off in traffic. You can empathize with them and you could say all these things that are good instead of negative. Same thing about you. If you have a snack at night and you didn't really want to have too many cookies and you had a couple extra, you could say, you know what? I just needed those cookies. It's fine. I'll be great. I could just work on it tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. We can have less cookies then, you know? Yeah. And this, you know, we're just going to bring up the topic of free will because it's something we always bring up too. But, you know, we have that choice. We have the choice to be um, the, what we're going to talk about is the next tenant, but to be a victor and not a victim. Um, so uh, we've been given that ability to make that choice. And um, I also wanted to bring up good and evil, because this is a topic that I first asked Brandon about when we first started talking about all these philosophical philosophical things and i was wondering because one time i talked about something about okay so what's you know why is there such thing as good and evil or i remember how i asked but i brought up the topic and he told me i don't really like using the words good and evil because they're not the best words to use it just don't really describe it very well um so anyway, I want to give it to Brandon so he can kind of talk about that. Yeah, well, I, you know what? Just in you saying that makes me think of um, how we talk about viewing things that happen, you know, just out in the world through different lenses. And, um, you know, you could have like a physical view and a spiritual kind of view of things. And that's how we look at it. And I think in a physical view, it could be argued that, yeah, there is a good and evil, right? If someone's out there doing, killing people and stuff that you could say that's evil, but then it's not think, against, it's not following the golden rule, not following the golden rule. It's negative behavior. You can even have positive behavior and negative behavior. You could, um, I think you could kind of measure it, you know? And so, but if you look at it on the spiritual level, I think that's the difference where you realize that everything is part of God's plan. So for some reason, it's part of God's plan for this guy to go over there and, you know, kill a bunch of people. Now, it doesn't mean that you're okay with it. And you consent to it. It just means- and it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that God's okay with it and that God consents to it. It just means we have free will. And that is the path we chose. But you know what? God is loving and forgiving. You know, Jesus forgave the people on as he's on the cross, he's forgiving the people who are killing him at the moment. So that's what we're talking about as the spiritual aspect of it. See them in a positive light of they are going through j their journey and this is what they must experience. This is must this must be what was the plan for them. Otherwise it wouldn't have happened to them. It's the ultimate gift, right, for the creator to give to his creation, to allow them to do anything that they want. And then by taking these actions and doing anything they want, they gain this knowing. Some people, I guess, take longer than others, whatever. I mean, who knows? Maybe we were all murderers in a past life. Uh, maybe we all had to experience that just so we could know what it's like so, to know that we don't want to do it. And it's funny because I think earlier, it was either earlier in this episode because I'm going to let everyone in on a little inside secret. Uh, this is, we've been recording this in two parts. So about 30 minutes ago <laughs> now, maybe a little less, uh, you probably noticed our hair changed a little, but we were recording this Sounds at another date. So, but anyway, Sharon was talking about Gandalf and Lord of the Rings talking to Frodo and uh, about specifically talking about Gollum, right? And Frodo was like, well, 
you know, I wish Bilbo had killed Gollum when he had the chance. And Gandalf says something like, you know, many people have the power to take life, but few have the power to give it. Do you have that power? You know, can you, you can take life, but can you give it? Is it really your choice? And then he says something about, you know, he may still have some part to play. And as Sharon was saying, yeah, he had a huge part to play because spoiler alert, we won't say exactly what happened, but we know, I don't think the ring would have got destroyed the way that it did in the movie if Gollum didn't live till the end. So he was like this necessary evil, right? So you can hate him all you want. I mean, literally he's just like a hobbit, but he's the worst example of a hobbit. <laughs> he's mean and you know all this stuff. It, it, he does have some redeeming qualities when he starts to kind of turn around a little bit, but then he, uh, you know, goes right back down. He gives in to down. his, yeah. Yeah, he, he gives, gives in to in. his negative thoughts again. But because of that, the whole world is saved, right? Um, so I feel like the good and evil question really is one of how you're going to look at it. You can look at it on this visit, and it depends on who you're interacting with, right? Because you're hanging out with a bunch of people and they're saying, oh, you know, it's terrible what's going on in that country that rhymes with Schmizrael, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the Schmalatinian, Schmalatine people and the Schmalatinians, uh, the way they're being treated and stuff. You know, you could, if you're around people that are saying that you could be like, yeah, man, but they're just waking from the dream, right? It's cool that these kids are getting murdered and stuff. It's fine. They'll be fine. You know, you could say that, but you might kind of, you might start a fight. People might think you're crazy. You could, so you can either just say nothing or you could just say, yeah, that is terrible that they have to go through the suffering, you know? Um, yeah. Because we're not here to change everyone's mind. I always, and we talked about this before. I felt like I used to be like that all the time. I'd always have to bring it up. But, um, you know, this is another tenet we're going to talk about. The truth doesn't need any defense. Why do I have to be the truth's lawyer and go out there and try to convince everybody? You know, they'll figure it out eventually. I just got to keep living my life uh, as best I can. And that's the best thing I can do for people. I feel like. Yeah. And it, may, it makes me think of two like examples of like um, what's kind of going on um, in the world right now with regards to the nation in which we reside and that is uh, the Shmi united mates are um yeah coming into the country oh um, yeah in a diff different way you know and and them being given all these privileges and these um and this you know quote money um and you know people are getting really upset about that and we're we're talking like, about yeah, illegal is that is that help sorry yes are they help is that helping is that helping you know to get upset about it it doesn't help um and can i do anything about it not really so i just give it to god you know there must be a reason could it be that these people are being given an experience to maybe help them you know how we were talking about earlier in the episode when we were talking about um you know knowledge comes from experience it's their time probably to experience all without that they wouldn't know what it's like to have a materialistic view in this world if they didn't have that in their country and so they're being given this opportunity to kind of maybe ex, uh, ex experience and I can't, I, I'm not putting it into the best words, but um, maybe Brandon, uh, we have a, we have a, are we, uh, are we connected? Yeah, we're, I'm here still. I think we have a little delay. I, I will take this over because what why you were saying that so eloquently, I think it's like a test. They're begin they're they're these so these Shmi legal Shmi immigrants are uh I think it's like a test they're being given, you know. And A, who knows if it's even real? Um, who knows how many Shmi legal Shmi immigrants uh are actually receiving this aid and this uh all this free money or whatever. But it is like a test. If you think about how people could be, maybe they're dirt poor in some countries that we, we would view them as dirt poor. And then they all of a sudden get a, a place to live in New York City and they get all this money 
every month in a form of a credit card, it's going to be a real test for them because a they're getting acclimized uh, to instead of paying for things with like barter, maybe they used to pay or cash. Now they're going to be using credit cards and credit and they're going to be signing up for credit cards. And it's a whole nother, you know, smartphones are going to be getting, they're going to have access now to their children might have access to like porn and stuff and anything that's on the internet, which is crazy. All these different rabbit holes that people could get sucked into and, and stuck in, um, especially if they have poor roots, they might have some kind of socialistic leaning. So they might get uh, sucked into schmosalism, <laughs> socialism. <laughs> I was going to say accelerating their growth for conscious, uh, you know, le- leveling yeah. up their consciousness. I'm sure a lot of people that's what's going to happen, but some of them are going to sink down and get stuck in this stuff and then they'll have yeah, other. Absolutely. So what I mean by accelerating is, is like they would not have experienced that otherwise, other, otherwise a hundred percent. So this is just going to be like a, okay, now you're going to experience it now. Cause without the experience, you're not going to know what this is like. And who knows these people could have had, you know, pretty good, happy lives, but for some reason they, maybe there was some propaganda that led them this way. Maybe it was terrible. Some of these people, but some of these people might've had great lives and they're going to come here and they're going to feel empty because of the materialism, especially in New York city. They're going to go to times square and be like, what in the total F is this? You know? Um, So I think it's good to have compassion for those people. And if, if I was to say I was somebody who was upset by this, I think that it would just speaking to the golden rule and stuff like that. You're just pointing the finger outwards at a broken system or something else when maybe there's something inside of you that you could be looking at, you know, cause like we love to say, when you're pointing one finger, there's three pointing back right at you, baby, the magical number three. So I think that, um, it's just a good indication if you anger, you know, so if you do have anger over this, it's okay. You could still, you it's know, it's a love way yourself. to work on yourself too. You're like, yeah. And then you're right. Why is this indication like going off? Like we talked about for anger. or fear? Why am I jealous? Why am I upset that they get a five-star hotel and I don't <laughs> that they get a debit card with free money. And don't people say nothing is free. You know, they're going to get the experience of their lives, accelerating their <laughs> spiritual journey. <laughs> And I'm sure they're only going to be in five star hotels for a certain a select bit. limited time before right. they get shuffled into some kind of ghetto or hood or, yeah, you know, uh, so, or maybe, Hey, maybe they pick themselves up by the bootstraps and they're hard workers and they can establish a life and become a contributing citizen right. to this place. And I understand the whole, uh, illegal immigrant argument. You know, I get it both sides. I understand, um, you know what it makes me both sides of it because I'm my, my Libra energy. You know what it makes me think of is that episode that we where we talked about the Bushmen in um I forgot even where it was in the Kalahari. I was gonna say that the Kalahari Bushmen, and when they experienced something like this, right? It's very appealing. This um, you know, the the the, the whore of Babylon, right? this materialistic point of view or this materialistic life can be very appealing to somebody who is, uh, you know, just a regular, especially a child. Maybe the adults are already set in their ways, you know, like the Kalahari, but the, the children, that's really where I think the war is, uh, for these minds. Cause it really is kind of like mind control because the Kalahari Bushmen, the ones that live in the bush, they're, they're just doing their own thing and they don't have any real, they have their own kind of maybe mind control and they're, tribe or whatever but the children if they see this materialistic world and they're tempted by it they get right on it you know it's it's Mm -hmm. really crazy but again it's everyone's path it's just another set of challenges for them to overcome to to just elevate their consciousness yeah um the next thing i was going to talk about when it comes to this concept of like is it good or evil is um, something that we've talked about obviously before, um, but it's this intention being at the root of whether something is quote good or evil. And we're talking physical realm at this point because, um, you know, 
you can use, we've talked about like we can tools like guns, you know, we can use the tool for good or we can use it to harm someone um, or our, or harm ourselves. But, you know, we also have talked about the tarot, for example, being a tool and, and how you use it is, is the intention, right? That's at the root of what you get your outcome. So I'll let Brandon take it from here. Oh, the way about tools and stuff. Yeah. And tarot. Yeah. I, well, I, I, this is something we've talked about a bunch earlier though, on our, our oversharing journey where um, people will look at certain tools and demonize them. And it happens on different levels. Like people, some people demonize guns, like you were saying, some people demonize tarot. And I feel like it is just your own attachment to it. That is uh, that you need to worry about. Right. So you can use the tarot to look at the symbols and, and get a better understanding of symbolism and get symbol literate. You can do card pulls to navigate where you are in this realm and kind of look around but I really feel like it has a lot to do with the questions that you ask and the point of view that you're coming from. Because if you're looking at the tarot to solve your problems and for it to be a like a fortune teller, uh, you know, if you're looking for a glimpse of the future, I'm not saying that, hey, maybe it could give you a glimpse of the future. But just like in a movie, when you have a genie, and people get three wishes and they'll, they'll wish for something or just like King Midas and the Midas touch story. You know, he wants everything that he touches to turn to gold or he wakes up one day and everything he touches turned to gold. And at first it's great. He's going around turning everything to gold. He's really rich, but then he can't touch anybody else. He can't even touch his love. So in that way, I think if you're using the tarot as an Oracle, um, you might be, telling yourself or hearing what you want to hear from it or could it be an evil dark negative entity force or whatever entity. or a force is edit is entering in to show you different things to lead you further into materialism or whatever so i think that when people have you know when they're cautious about the tarot and stuff i think that's great unless you have a deeper better yes. understanding it's good to just kind of take your time and really again the self-knowledge thing is what's to me, paramount here. And if you're using this as a tool for self-knowledge, I think it is a great tool. And so, you know, it, people demonize the tar tarot. I don't get offended by it. If they think it's evil and all this stuff, I get it. To them, it is evil. It could be evil. Um, but right. again, just like a tool, just like a hammer, you can use it to build a house or you can use it to smash a window and break, uh, steal things. Yeah. Um, you were talking about uh, something that just made me think of that um, Jesus Ouija board that remember I sent that to yeah. you on Instagram. <laughs> hey, oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm talking to regular Jesus. Know. He's telling me to fucking go do my Dharma. <laughs> yeah. So there was one last thing I kind of wanted to touch on before we move on to the next tenet. But um if you feel the need to, and this is okay because we all have done it, you know, and we all probably still do it to some extent. But, you know, you, you feel like you need to judge someone who is polar, I'll say polarizing negatively, or you might say who is being evil, or, you know, you, you point the finger and you're like, oh, he's evil. Um, just remember that they're adding to their own karma. It's nothing to do with you. Um, so why would you then judge that person for that, you know, and, you know, even the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, um, their own, um, you know, cause and effect, their own actions will produce their karmic repercussions and consequences and reactions. So, um, there's no need for judgment and anger toward people. Um, I get it that you you know, we do, I, you know, I get angry sometimes or upset about something, but I always have to come back, turn around, remind myself of all these things that we talk about on our show. We all, we all have our own little circle in this realm and it's up to us to focus 
and to keep our own circle clean, to keep our own mirror, if you will, clean. Um, in the Toltec tradition, they, uh, which Sharon and I have read a few books by, uh, was it Don Miguel Don Ruiz? Don Miguel Ruiz and his sons. Ruiz and his sons. And one of the things that they talk about in the Toltec um, the heritage, right? The <laughs> Uh, they talk about a smoky mirror and how that's how people view the world. And when it's obscured with a lot of smoke, they don't really see the truth. And the more, basically the, what they say is the more you look into yourself and have self love that the mirror starts to clear. So when you first get onto a lot of the stuff, you could start to point the finger at other people and you feel like, look at their mirror. It's so smoky. Look at, uh, look at their behavior. It's so crazy. But just like um, a parent, with a child, say there's a child that's like talking about a sibling at dinner, like, oh, he's not finishing his food. He's not eating his food, but his plate is still full and he hasn't eaten his food either. He's just trying to deflect the attention to someone else so he can get away with doing what he's not supposed to do, uh, really. And even if it's a subconscious thing, they don't realize it. So again, going back to pointing the finger and the golden rule and stuff, it really is just the negative inverse of the golden rule with loving others is really to love yourself and the way to do that is just to accept yourself how you are and you know even if all this stuff that we talk about spirituality and like a magic uh spiritual realm like what if it is just physical and we just die and nothing happens well then i would say it is some kind of cosmic miracle that we're here and we might as well make the best of that situation and what we're talking about Really, at the end of the day, which is something I've noticed I love to say at the end of the day, but I'm going to say it here at the end of the day, things in the world happen. This is kind of the Buddhist view because there's a whole school of Buddhism that doesn't even think there's like a spiritual realm. They're more like atheists, I guess. And what they do is they just accept everything for mm -hmm. what it is, because that is really what it is at the end of the day. It is part of some plan, even if there isn't a, a God or a cosmic creator, if you could start to accept things for the way they are, then you could move forward and actually improve things in the world yeah. or in your life. And what we're saying here is not going to harm you. If you, if you do this yeah. until the day you die, it's not harming you. It's not a bad thing or a negative thing. So yeah, it's not any kind of know, cult or mind control. You know, you don't, all you have to do is send us a hundred bucks, uh, <laughs> more laws, more problems com, one hundred and one dollars exactly. No, 111 for your you subscription. <laughs> send us 111. If you want to go to heaven. <laughs> oh my God. But anyway, um, yeah, no, you just gotta, yeah, that's the best part about all this stuff we're talking about. There's nothing to sign. There's no oaths to take, uh, you know, mm -hmm. There's nobody to be beholden to, you know, just Absolutely. yourself at the end of the day, because we all come into this world alone and we will all exit. Well, most people probably exit alone. Maybe you could die with somebody else, but we're all going to kind of leave here in that same way. So it's like, you know, yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what so else something about. you said about the Toltec tradition, you talked about a smoky mirror. I was reading one of the books and I'm reading a few of them. <laughs> Yeah, um, so which one I don't remember if it was Jose Don Jose or Don Miguel or his son but one of them said something about um, a mirror and it wasn't exactly what you talked about but I found it interesting too and he said just imagine that you had never seen yourself in a reflection like you never you don't have a mirror and you never saw it like how would you know what you look like how would you perceive yourself now could you go by what people are telling you you know you're like oh you have your mother's eyes you know and your father's nose and, you, and so you could look at your mother's eyes and be like okay that's what my eyes look like and your father's nose that's what my nose looks like or whatever but you look would you really know because people all always have their own perceptions of what you look like you have that family resemblance sometimes that shows up, but some people see it and some people don't. I have friends that growing up with my sister, whom I don't think she and I look alike um, that much, my younger sister. Um, but, you know, growing up, some people would be like, you know, oh, are you so-and-so sister? You know, and I'm be like, wow, like I didn't 
think we looked that much alike. And some people would say, oh, you guys look so much alike. And some people were like, I would never have known you guys were sisters. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I got it's, that too. it's perspective, right? It's total perspective. Um, so how would you know what you looked like? So you can't basically the point of the story is you can't rely on what other people think of you. You know, pretend you have no mirror and what like how do you know about you it's 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 just you you just have yourself like pretend there's no mirror and don't rely on the perceptions of others i mean there could be good things they could say you're handsome or beautiful or xyz you know but if you rely on what they say then you could get hurt when they say something that hurts or you could get an ego because someone's, you know, constantly praising you. So it, but if you know who you are, um, you can take the praise and say, thank you. I appreciate that. And you can take the whatever else and you could say, you know, I don't, I don't concur. It doesn't hurt my feelings. Like if you think I'm an X, Y, Z jerk or whatever. Okay. That's your perspective. Thank you for that too. <laughs> And that's yeah. the whole don't take things personally thing too from the Toltec tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Love it. Yeah. So, but uh, you wanted to talk about like in every situation, like changing your default response and could it be your perception or your fault when something quote negative happens? Yeah, I think that's a big one. And we kind of covered that a little bit talking about point pointing the finger. But I think it's one thing that that I've done um, in my whole path now that really helps is when something bad happens or as I perceive evil or something that I wasn't planning for or that just could make me upset. I try to say, all right, how instead of saying, oh, it was this person's fault. And the simple example that I use is just hitting my head, you know, because I'm a kind of a giant six five. And growing up, I would hit my head a lot. Once in a while, I'll still hit my head. But um, I used to get mad at the wall or like whatever I hit my head on. I would get mad at that thing, you know, and I'd be like, have a rage. And I'd be like, I need to punch this wall. Um, and, you know, especially when I was younger, it was real. And now looking at it, it's like, well, I'm the one who moved my head in the way. This this house has always been always here. There. But, you know, this low thing has always been this way. I know if I stood up or walked toward it or rolled back enough, I'll, I'll hit my head. I should know that. It's not the house builder's fault or the house. And in that way, in that simple, funny example, it's the same way if you get into a car accident or if you're going to fight with somebody or if you trip or if you drop something or whatever it is. Um, if you get caught cheating, you know, any kind of, uh, behavior that you engage in and then negative consequences, quote unquote, negative consequences come your way. Right. That's mm -hmm. really what it is. It's just your own behavior. And it's kind of like that thing where, you know, uh, that saying where basically I was looking for who was at fault for all the problems in my life. And I realized it was me, you know, like I'm the center of all the problems. Damn it. It's all my fault. I'm the common denominator. <laughs> yeah. I'm the common denominator. That's exactly what I was talking about. And that's yeah. really what um, that leads us, like we said about the, oh, go ahead. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah. Well, I was just going to lead it to, you know, that these difficulties in our lives, like they point to where we can do some inner work. You know, why am I getting angry? You know, we've called this self-healing shadow work talked about the dark night of the soul when something of an epiphany hits you but it's the epiphany of like you know oh my god i've been wrong this whole time and you know now i have to deal with all of that and kind of giving yourself time to you know you know love and time to heal from that that hit of uh the the wake up yeah and it, it's tough because it's like you don't know how to be in the world and i, I wrote a whole book about this everybody go to shadowworked.com we'll put a link 
down below and you could uh, check that book out. It's 1111 for that book. If you want to give me a donation, I'll send you the PDF in the EPUB. Um, but a lot of people talk about, you know, you hear this word shadow work and dark night of the soul. They're like everywhere now. It's kind of like a cool thing to say. And, uh, but it really is. It, it's funny because it, talking about like being a victor, not a victim. It's really what happens is, I feel like, so you're going along doing your thing. You, you're doing it till it's done. You don't even realize that you're doing it till it's done. Right. And then you have this moment where you're like, oh man, I can't believe I've been living this way. I want to change my behavior. This isn't really who I am. You have like an ego death. You realize that maybe you've been acting this way in the world because you had this hole in your soul and you're trying to fill it with all kinds of uh, sense pleasure experiences. And then you realize that. And so now this sense pleasure experience that you were formerly engaging in you know um it just doesn't fulfill it anymore it's like empty and hollow because you realize what you've been doing so you're stuck in this place kind of like a, a a caterpillar when he goes into a cocoon you're locked in and now you really don't know how to act in the world and you don't know how to be and you're kind of trying to formulate your behavior and you're becoming a new person you're growing this new skin right this new exterior and uh i feel like in there, the victimhood slips in. It could slip in because then you're like, why did this happen to me? Or, or I'm just stuck. What do I do? How do I, how do I be in the world? So you're kind of overcoming that. So I think the dark night of the soul is, could be even said to be overcoming your newly found victim status. And then when you figure it out and you have a, a new way to be in the world and you realize that you're not a victim, I feel like that's when you truly come out of it. And you, um, you become another person. You kind of level up to a certain extent. It really just raises your consciousness is what you're doing. Because what's, what's going on is you had this consciousness. You didn't know before that whatever you're doing, running around, you didn't realize it was hurting other people. And then when you come to that realization that you're hurting others with your behavior, and that's not what you want to do, you got a little enlightenment. Your consciousness just went up a little bit. You have, a, you aligned your actions and your behavior uh, with truth a little more. And so I feel like when you actually realize that's what you've done, that's the next step. And then you can uh, really incorporate this thing that you're not a victim into your life. That's when it takes on a whole new, you can take on a whole new perspective in a worldview. And you realize that we're, all of us are just flowing along. We're kind of just big. Uh, uh, we're products of our own environment and our circumstances and everything that's happened to us. A lot of us are just running these programs off. And when you realize that, that's when you can truly wake up. And people will say they woke up. Oh, I woke up. But really, I think what happens is they fall into another trap. And you mm -hmm. just keep falling into different traps. You know, I woke up to the truther thing. And I realized that 7-Eleven uh, isn't always open 24 hours a day. And it's not a, it could be an inside job to work at 7-Eleven or, you know, whatever. <clears throat> and the government's evil and George Bush did it. Well, now you're just in another trap, right? You're blaming George Bush for all your problems. When that guy, he just, he just likes to party, man. You know, he's, he's probably a legend. <laughs> I mean, I wish I was in Yale and Bush was there. I would have been his boy. Like, <laughs> uh, but you know, if you take that point of view, then that loses all its power over you because what people don't realize is if you think the government or these there's people cabal running the world, you're giving them your power. You're giving them the power to do that. Right. So they're yeah, not running my life. They're not, they didn't make I, me do this podcast, you know? Exactly. And, exactly. I yeah, went hiking what, to work yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> what I would just add to that is that, you know, you might not just have one dark night of the soul, like, Brandon says you just kind of level up when you do. So you might have multiple over your lifetime, this lifetime. So it could it be that's what this life is about? If you want, if you if you come to the conclusion that this life is about raising your consciousness, well, mm -hmm. then it is about falling into other traps every time. But if you don't see it as a trap and you change that word trap as challenge. Then you just took away a little victim. You're like, oh, I didn't fall into another trap. I just, there's another challenge. I'm like, super it's a little hurdle. I rescued the princess and oh, nope, sorry. Your princess is at another castle. You know, you got this one. <laughs> Oops. You Next. set her free now, but now you have the skill, you know, how to throw the fireball, you know, a lot better. You can jump and 
but at that, jump I over that hurdle. Like that's what it is, right? Uh, up until the next um, hurdle, exactly. All these hurdles, and then, like we said earlier in this episode, you're pointing at other people's hurdles when you're when you're calling out other people's bad behaviors. It's like, well, yeah, but what about your own hurdles? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's could that be escapism too? Pointing out everybody else's hurdles. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it really has to do with truth because truth is one of the most is the most offensive thing, I feel like, to be speaking truth. And how much truth can you handle is really the question. And when you come across that thing where you're just like, ah, I don't know, man, this is where I have to draw the line. Um, and then you'll go along in that challenge until you break out of that and then you get to the next one. And you yeah. see how much truth you can handle uh, until you get to the point where, like, all right, that's enough for now. I gotta, I gotta do this for a while. And yeah. but it, if you, it really depends on how you frame it because a lot of people think this is like a soul trap and a loose farm, like we talked about, and that we're stuck here. But if you look at it as just challenges and you're leveling up, I mean, you're already you're just hacking away at that victim narrative. That yeah. I feel like this whole quote unquote negative inverted world that we see out in front of us it runs off this victim narrative so the more you chop away the victim narrative out of your own life you know jesus said i brought a sword well maybe that sword was to chop out that victimness right you cut it away then you're kind of free from that inverted world you could see it for what it is and you don't judge it anymore and actually maybe you're even thankful for it if you can get to that point i mean you're really starting to to um to expand your consciousness and level up if you could like look at the Rothschilds and Bill Gates, you know, yeah. and I think like, we're segueing hey, into the truth needs no defense tenant. Yeah, we totally are. And, and you look at those people and you're thankful for them. You're like, I'm glad Bill Gates is doing what he's doing because it's really waking people up man. he's a buffoon out there. He's just a big clown. It's hilarious. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it and help him out and donate to him or <laughs> any of that stuff or even say you like them you don't even have to tell people but inside if you're like yeah man that guy's a fucking clown he's killing it out there these people are just silly um yeah yeah and um i the point i would or like to bring up is about um you know arguing you know how people want to argue their point and but them and this and that and pointing Debates, fingers and, debating and debating and you know, what we jokingly called woke raping is, you know, trying to tell somebody something they're not ready to hear. Um, and, you know, everyone is ready in their own time. So what is the point of, you know, arguing with somebody or having a debate with somebody? Um, it's, it's just all, it's the ego that wants this attention. I'm right. And I know better and I can teach you something. And, uh, you know, truth needs no defense. <laughs> exactly. And I'm going to come a little bit here off the cuff and I'm going to throw a little curveball. This isn't on the notes, but if you think about what this realm is, right, you think about like Neville Goddard and we've talked about Neville Goddard a bunch. He talks about manifesting things in alignment with the golden rule. If you want something in your life, you just picture yourself having it. You just think about it all the time. You act as if you have it. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you take that whole way that the realm works and you apply it to a debate, both sides of the debate, if they're fully engrossed in this belief that they have, they're going to find evidence that supports it when they go out and look for it, they're going to see it in the world. Both of them, you know, it seems like a contradiction, but, both sides are going to be able to prove their point um, logically, at least to themselves and probably to other people. So when they come at each other and people who debate, just let me say this, people yeah, yeah. who people who um, there are people out there who can speak eloquently and persuasively, and they may be telling you a complete lie, but you might believe it if you're not aware of that. A hundred percent. Or if they believe their own lie, they're even more convincing. Because mm -hmm. the truth is coming through and they're speaking that truth vibration to their knowing, right? So because mm -hmm. of that, no one's really going to win this debate. 
And, you know, maybe you have a debate with somebody and somebody can actually win the debate. I'm not saying that's not possible, but I'm just looking at this from a whole totally different angle that the truth needs no defense because everyone has their own truth, right? And this gets into the, you know, is there such things as truth and all that? But and people will say moral relativism and stuff, and it's like okay. But and I think that comes back to the physical way of looking at things, and also the spiritual way of looking at things, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff before, and uh, yeah, so that's that's a reason. And you look at that, and then also like Sharon said, with the truth thing, you know, defense. You know, if God did exist or there is a, a creator, do you think that they need you? to be their lawyer, right? And to <laughs> defend them and to tell them how it is. People are gonna, even if they have something that, that they have as a perceived truth and it's a truth to them, they could speak about it and they they sound like they're telling the truth. They might encounter one day that they, it's a lie, right? And they're gonna have this whole dark night of the soul thing happen to them like we just said. If they do. If they do. But are you gonna be able to give that to them? Think about your own behavior. Like if I go back to the way, my womanizing ways in that point of view, I used to have this discussion with people about it and they would hit me with all this logical things. And I had my own truth, which was also true. And it was like a justification that I was using it was true for, for my, you at my own time. actions, right? People have these justifications. So it's really hard to get around that stuff. And also when you're debating somebody or you're disagreeing with them, you're not accepting them on a certain level. They realize that you're not accepting them for who they are. And if they have a, a spiritual or even kind of mental age that's like a child because we talked about this people are kind of just like children running around right um if they have that they're going to sense that you're not accepting them and they're just going to be automatically repelled so if you start off from a a, a kind of viewpoint of acceptance or a stance of acceptance it's going to throw them kind of through a loop and you're going to make them comfortable. And it doesn't mean you have to agree with what they're saying, but again, you don't have to prove your own point. You're not God's lawyer. You could just listen to them and be their witness. Um, and maybe there might be some truth that they say, and then you could focus on the things that they say that are true. If it's a Christian talking about Jesus, you'd be like, yeah, Jesus was, was great. Look at all the things that he said that were great. And the things that he did, weren't they amazing? All those things he did and the way he lived, wasn't that great? We should live like that, huh? <laughs> you know? Um, and I feel like you're going to get farther and maybe you'll give them something to think about because when you're, when you're arguing with somebody, all they do is go to justifications and to try to strengthen their position. And they, they shore up. It's like, if you have an invading army and you're trying to attack a town, that's like a walled town, they're going to pull everybody in. They're going to set a defense. And it's going to be a lot harder, but if you just kind of come in and you're this cool person and you're just talking to them and you have some people with you, have the same ideas, you're, you'll be able to infect them with your ideas much easier uh, in that regard. Kind of like a Trojan horse deal, you know, it looks like a gift. Yeah. Um, can you address for someone like who's saying, you know, that sounds like moral relativism to say everybody has their own truth. Can you address that? and answer why it is or isn't that well it's it's like another paradox right there uh there is absolute truth and there isn't absolute truth and it just depends on how you're looking at i think in your frame of mind like in, in the physical realm you could say there's absolute truth because if you jump out a window you're gonna fall to the ground there's certain things you can point to um cause and effect you can point to right but in the spiritual realm it's a little different i think it's more like works vibrationally it's more like a lodestone and and if you have magnetic filings and how they will adjust and change their behavior depending on the forces of magnetism that are going on it's like the unseen so i think what happens is people just get into trouble when they I think about absolute truth and um, relative truth because they just don't have a, a proper understanding of themselves. And I feel like truth is something that you can't actually point to, right? You can only, you can only say what's untrue because there's so many different circumstances and situations in this realm that pop up 
you know, it, it's just, it, it would be like almost impossible to say for everybody in every situation, what would be true and the right and correct thing to do in that situation. Absolutely. You right. know, and um, we've talked about that before with when, you know, we talk about everyone has experienced their own particular journey. Everyone is unique no one has experienced exactly identically the same exact thing. So because of those experiences that each person has had, their perspective and their experience will be different on some future thing, right? So like you said, for one person, the choice that they make for a certain thing will be different than for another person. And it doesn't make it um, evil it's just that is what the path entailed for them. And in the end, like we said, I think we talked about this before. In the end, everything polarizes positive again. So all this realm is for is to experience because that's the point. Experience and learning from your experience so that you can raise your consciousness and level up. So, you know, that person that chose to do something that you would quote, think is evil is that's just what they chose. And in this lifetime, and maybe next lifetime, they will have learned something or they will learn something and they'll eventually polarize positive. But in the end, we all do. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's just kind of like another way of saying it's all part of God's plan. And the last thing I want to say about the truth thing is I feel like when it's applied to the physical, which just means the exterior world, that's when you get into trouble with the whole relative truth and absolute truth thing. Um, because cults will form, people get together with their ideas and stuff. And, but what they're really doing is they're just pointing to the external. And really, if you want to see where absolute truth can be found, I think it's looking within, looking in the internal, uh, into your own behavior. And that's really where, um, if you're doing it in that way, I guess you can't really get in trouble if you have your own inner truths, but you realize that just because it's true for you, it's not true for everybody else. And I, I think that's really, really where the main distinction is. But if anybody... Yeah. has questions or a comment to that please leave it below and we can address it further um because there might be a part of the argument that i'm not addressing or whatever like that but i've thought about this a lot and i've talked to people about it before and it makes sense to me so help me make it sen make sense to you dear viewer <laughs> yeah and here's an here's just one thing that i can say to someone who says oh well more you know if you're morally relativistic, you're saying that you can believe anything you want. And like, I honestly don't understand why people get so upset about this moral relativistic stuff because I'm well, trying to explain it, it. But I think what happens is it because it can lead to really terrible things. People think of like Nazi Germany, you know, or right, right. Cults and stuff like that, which again, right. it's when you're it's like, to the exterior. Right. And it's like, if you follow the golden rule, then you don't have to worry about that. Exactly. That, I it's, was thinking that's the exact thing. That's really where it, it just gets, it's, it, if it was a debate, I would just say, okay, here, what, why don't we just forget about this debate and talk about the golden rule? Cause Jesus even said, this is the only rule you got to worry about. You know, he basically yeah. in the New testament, right. I forgot exactly how he puts it, but he's like, well, he says the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, love people. 100%. And you have to find a way to love yourself and love God for your own self, right? In your own way. No one can tell you how to do it. No one can tell you to, how to accept the worst parts of yourself that you hide from the world. No one can tell you to accept that and be okay with it. Doesn't mean that you have to make a book and write it like I did or whatever, but um, just for you to accept, it doesn't matter who else accepts it. That's the external validation again, right? And I can also see why these what I'm saying sounds very dangerous because you can also be a psychopath and say these same things. Right. But, um, uh, that again, that's the again, it goes, that boils back to intention. Yeah. If exactly. you're a psychopath, what is your intention? Yeah. You're not I'm following the golden rule. Right. Yeah. Right. 
But when you have the golden rule as your basis, you're, you defeat all those other arguments. In my yeah, it's kind of like when somebody says that Aleister Crowley was evil because he said, do as thou wilt should be the whole of the law. He really meant true will that is in alignment with the golden rule. That's what he meant. <laughs> yeah. And I love how his switch of the justice card and the strength card in the Crowley deck, because I feel like their whole point of view was the most important thing in the universe of the realm it's is strength. will is the strength of will, because you have to get yourself to do that. Whatever it is you want to do you have to get yourself to show up and be in the present moment you actually have to work at it just as if you were a skinny little dude and you want to be a bodybuilder every day you're gonna to have to eat right you're gonna to have to work out you're gonna to have to be very mindful of a lot of things it's the same thing with mindfulness you have to be mindful to wake from the dream and, uh, and realize that and then be easy on yourself and do all these things right be in the present so, moment. Um, it is really takes the inner strength and I'm not saying and then so the other people will say that justice is the most important thing now, to me, it doesn't matter what the most important thing is. It's to you what's most important. But I think Crowley made that distinction. And Michael Tessarion's talk about this, which I'm really excited about. He talks about, and he, he, uh, this is where I got that information. But he was saying how the way Crowley looked at it is you really need that strength. That strength of will is one of the hardest things. Because at the end of the day, what it is, I said it again, what it is is just you battling your own uh, attachments, right? Your attachments to sense pleasure in a lot of situations where you want to go out and engage in that escapism, but you actually have to stop yourself to do it and use that will. But again, like I said, sometimes it just happens because you have an epiphany, you have an awakening, but sometimes in order to have that epiphany or awakening, like what happened to me, I, I didn't really know what was going on, but I had, I started to meditate and get into the present moment and that's what helped me. But I had to use that strength, that inner force of will to do it every day, to remind myself to do it, to actually sit down and do it. Like wherever I went, I, we went to Vegas for a few days and I would get up early every morning because we were going to classes. So we'd have to kind of get up early uh, to go to these DJ classes that we we're doing. And uh, I'd have to get up even earlier, get dressed, go outside, find a place to meditate for 10 or 20 minutes. So I had to use that, but I was actually excited about doing it. Um, so I feel like that's how energy works. That's why it's the eight is strength even because it's like perpetual. You just get it in motion and you, you catch that wave. Yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah. I was going to say, and not that it's <clears throat> uh, germane to the topic necessarily because it's not part of the uh, tenets, but you were talking about the switch, the eight and 11 switch in the tarot. Um, I wonder if it wasn't the, um, writer weight that switched it. I feel like it was originally um, eight strength and uh, sorry, sorry, eight justice, justice and 11 strength um, because of some, I don't know, some stuff that I came across that made me think of, of that. But well, that's know. what Crowley did say. Uh, I believe if I'm not mistaken, he did say he's putting the, it back to the correct order right because i think the writer weight is what switched it yeah because of the think, order of the golden dawn or something like that they and, they thought it was that way and so because of that and they influenced so many decks maybe Crow crowley was like no i'm gonna do this i'm gonna put it back and so I don't that know. reminds me that whole like frame of thinking where justice is the most important thing it kind of reminds me of we're trying to save the world. Yeah, it's very victimy, right? Kiki Olam or whatever that is, right? It could be victimy, right? Yeah. Interesting. Good point. Um, well, the last point we wanted to make on this truth needs no defense is um just reiteration of the concept of division and um how you know when people do these debates and all these things and and there's like a um what did they call it when there's like two choices and you know, you, there's like this fake view of like there being only two choices that you can make. What is that? Called? Oh yeah. Like false um, binary. So yeah. Yeah. False binary. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so anyway, Brandon, did you want to say something about that? The, um, the physical, like the egoic versus the spiritual 
and address the the division that Jesus talked about. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Oh, yeah. So I, I kind of hinted at this. And I, I think so we've talked about this before on the show. And I feel like what Jesus is saying there in a, a course, right? This is my view, my dharma, my path. So this is what it means to me. It doesn't mean that it has to mean this to you but or anyone else. But I feel like he was talking about the sword of cutting, like to distance yourself or to be different than other people. You're using the sword. And if you think about what a sword is, it's mental air. ideas, air. mental ideas. And it doesn't even mean that you're speaking these ideas to other people. It's just on the mental plane. So you you could start to distance yourself from other people or ha- think differently from them. Maybe is what he's talking about. I bring a sword. It's a different mm-hmm. way of thinking. Ooh. You know, you're going to chop mm-hmm. these other people away. It doesn't mean that they're actually other people. Maybe even that you have to distance yourself from like your family. Chop just, other ideas away. Yes. The, the ways of thinking. You're not going to think like these people anymore. Um, in the mental, in the mental way, you're, you might think of yourself now as a victor instead of a victim. And yeah, that is going to chop a lot of people away from you in your life. But And Jesus talks about that. And I think it's related. And he says something about mother against daughter and father against son and all these things. And it's because when you come to some of these ideas, people around you will be like, what are you talking about? You, you don't make sense. And that's when you know that you've, you've touched on something. <laughs> yeah. So maybe speak in parables from now on. <laughs> Right. Or just let your actions speak for you uh, instead of trying to change people's minds like we were talking about in the the debating realm. Um, And the other thing that Jesus could be talking about is with the whole sword thing, uh, coming to bring a sword and not peace and love. It's kind of like fighting the New Age movement, right? Because the New Age movement would be. Oh yeah, it's cool, man. Everyone's we're just doing our thing. He said peace. He didn't say love. He just said peace. Oh, peace. Yeah, my bad. Peace. But yeah, yeah, I get it. It's very hippie. (laughs) Yeah, peace could definitely be a bad thing if that peace is achieved because everybody has to think the same way and be the same person Mm -hmm. and a fake peace, like today's, you know, exactly homogenization. Yes, and what do they call it? Tolerance. Tolerance. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, you know, I, I feel like that could definitely be part of it. He's, he's probably obviously more talking about the mental realm, the spiritual realm, these things. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So in regards to victim, uh, well, what, what's uh, tenant? Where are we at? Tenant? We were at truth needs no defense. Yeah. Truth needs no defense. There you go. Exactly. So. But it applies to some of the other tenants too. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, they definitely bleed into each other. We were uh, talking about division, though, in particular. Division, that's the one. Okay, so that's the division. That's like on the spiritual level. Now, on the physical level, the division is, all right, I woke up to these truths. Uh, you know, maybe we didn't go to the moon or whatever. So now I'm going to bring it up at Thanksgiving, and I'm going to fight with everybody, and then it's going to create this division. Now, the spiritual division I feel like he's talking about, is that Jesus is talking about, or the sword that he brought, just means that you could still be physically with these people, but it doesn't mean you're on the same level as them vibrationally. It doesn't mean you're any better than them because then that's another ego trap. They're going to fall back down, <laughs> which is fine. Um, so that's, I feel like what it's really about, right? It's like yeah. the division is internal. It's not external. So, because I feel like if you came across this truth and you did elevate your consciousness and you're vibrating on a higher level, why not be around the people who were your family and you grew up with, you know, you don't, as long as you're not acting like a victim and you're not taking things personally, you're like a superhero because whatever they say, it doesn't matter. Now this might take like a capybara. You're like a capybara, right? You realize that these people are just forgive them father for they know not what they do. They're, they're Mm -hmm. just looking out for my best interest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're giving me their ideas for what works. They think what works best for them in their life. And they're trying to apply it to me. Because again, if you're displaying different behavior than somebody else, and it could be seen as more positive behavior, that person that is doing more negative behavior might think that you're judging them or might not feel good enough to be around you. 
it might blame you and try to ostracize you and, and uh, stay away from you. So, but yeah. Yeah. So speaking of a spiritual ego or like falling off of an ego or whatever, <laughs> um, the next tenet is thou shalt not put us on a pedestal. And this was just kind of a funny thing because of course the 10 commandments have thou shalt not. Right. And we jokingly talk about it before where we say like, when you tell somebody, you know, that they shouldn't do something that that's exactly what they want to do. <laughs> Yeah, we, didn't, yeah. we didn't we didn't mean for the for it to, to do that so don't do the opposite yeah we're not like don't yeah put we're not on doing pedestal. that we're not you know, don't don't pe- put me on a pedestal just wink, kidding wink. worship me start a cult around us no we don't want the cult of oversharing uh and the reason we jokingly say this a lot is because we're both definitely early adopters to ideas and we feel like some of the things we've talked about in the past or even changes we've made in our lives that then a lot of people have also made those changes after us. And we're not saying it's because of us. It's just that we're again, early adopters. So we see these things, they make sense to us. We accept them and we move on with it. And uh, so we feel like our show, the things that we're talking about, not a lot of people, you know, so a lot of people are talking about spirituality and you can find a lot of other people talking about these things, but we take a mix of a lot of different other ideas, you know, Eastern, Western, new age, all these kind of things. And we take the good stuff out of it. And that's what we present to you here on the Oversharing show. So we feel like in the future, people can look back on this and be like, oh my God, they were so right about everything. We need to worship them. (laughs) What do we do next, Sharon and Brandon? You know, no, no. What you do next is just follow your own path and don't worry about us. We'll send you you to this episode. Yep. We'll send you this episode. If you feel overwhelming gratitude for us and you're in the financial position, go ahead, send us 111 and you can go to heaven. No, um, you know, 111,000. Yeah. $101,000 oh, to go to heaven. 111,000. <laughs> Sorry. 111 million. It's going up. Hurry up. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, last no, chance, just, last chance. Yeah. But what really makes us feel fulfilled is when people leave comments about how this resonates with them and how they're learning and you know on their view because it's cool because we see how we're actually helping others which i think is a great part of this but again like we said earlier you got to help yourself first right so i feel like some people start these spiritual channels feel like they're out to save everyone else and save the world but then they kind of they get to a point and then they they don't reflect anymore and they don't see how they could be better and they can better themselves and they feel like what they're doing by helping other people is actually helping everybody. So they focus on that. And then, uh, you know, they just forget to work on themselves and they get this ego, this stealthy ego that comes in, you know? Um, so we're trying not to do that. We're avoiding that in the oversharing show by instilling this tenant tenant. Yeah. Don't worship us <laughs> or anyone for that matter. If yeah. Or anybody. Yeah. We're not telling you what to do, but you know, if you would like to elevate your consciousness <laughs> more quickly, you know, maybe put someone at a pedestal that will fall and then you'll uh, gain yeah, the yeah. experience. Just don't do it to us. Just do it to somebody else. Go find someone else. Yeah, yeah. Go find someone else. You wanted to talk about pit and pedestal. Briefly. Yeah, I, I think that's something we talk about a lot in the Oversharing show. So we should definitely bring it up here on this, our 99th episode or I mean, it might even get break, broken might, down into two episodes at this point. It might, get a, it might be 100. All right, so this point. might be episode 100, everybody. And it, it's fitting because we did two different recordings. But um, the pit and pedestal thing is something that I think is great because uh, if you put somebody on a pedestal or an idea on a pedestal or a way of living, if you have something that you are blind to, you have a blind spot and you just follow it no matter what, then you're going to need a scapegoat. There's going to be somebody or something or uh, a religion or something that you're going to have to put in the pit to demonize because it's, it's just like anything that works in this realm, negative and positive. If you're giving that energy out, you're going to also have to give out that energy in a, in another way, your worship. Uh, But if you could stay conscious and in the present moment and look through whatever you're into and pick out the good stuff and leave the bad, it's more like the trivium process, really. It's that's basically what it is. You have the input, you have your uh, your grammar, your facts that are out there, maybe, and then you sift them through your logic, 
what makes sense to you, what doesn't make sense, what works for you, and you leave what doesn't work. And then you have your output, you have your new way of looking at things and you could share it with the world just like we're doing. And if you keep that frame of mind in the present moment, then you won't have to worry about putting things on pedestals because you real, you'll realize that there's nothing in this physical realm that deserves your worship and devotion in that way. And even probably in the spiritual, you know, you could say, Oh, you should fear God and worship God and praise God and all these things. But I, but I what think is like, God? Yeah. What are you actually worshiping and praising? At yeah. The end? Do you right. like when you worship God, do you see like this disembodied thing in the sky that looks down on you or something? Like, what are you think about it? You know, I'm just asking you to ask the question. I don't, you know, that's one of the things that never made sense to me. Like, well, what, what does it mean to love God? What does it mean to worship God? Never made sense to me. I know what it means now. Uh, like, having love for yourself yes. can be a way to worship and praise God because exactly. you are a creation of this God. So if you don't accept yourself for the way you are, you're saying, fuck you, God, you did it wrong. You got me wrong. You should have made me shorter or taller or whatever, you know. So you're not really trusting the plan and you're not having true, you, you have a demonization of something, which means that also you probably are putting something else on a pedestal, you know? Um, so this concept though, I feel like you might be able to put an ideal on a pedestal at the end of the day. Like you could say, I want to put the golden rule of living that way uh, on a pedestal. And then in the pit would be not living according to the golden rule. Maybe something like that would work out, but, I feel like when you are, when you have something on a pedestal, you don't realize the negative effect of that, which is like I said before, you need to scapegoat. There has to be like, if you put God on a pedestal, you have to have the devil. The devil's the evil one and you demonize him. But again, using Brandon logic, Brandonomics, if you say, hey, do you believe in God? Yes. Okay. God perfect. Yes. Did he create everything? Yeah. Well, then he created the devil. The <laughs> devil's part of his plan, which means he's perfect. Exactly. You're, you're arguing with God now, right now. You, yeah. you guys wanted to have a debate. You can't get any more logical than what I just said. It's like, you know. It's like simple. the episode. It's like the most recent Dow episode we did. I think we talked about this where I was talking about um, some books I'm reading and, and a video that I watched. But you have these things, these concepts of like God and the devil. And it's like that was all part of the plan. That's the the fall of man. It's not evil it was supposed to happen for you to raise your consciousness. Like you can't get up if you didn't fall. And the point is to get up and grow and learn and be better. Exactly. And pieces of God are going to rise faster and slower. You know, it's all in its time. And it's not up. Uh, it's not up to us to judge when or how or any of those things. It's just up to us to mind our own circle and to rise as best we can and to follow our path, you know, because I feel like uh, it's all part of the path, all the stuff we do, every, all, all, even and, the evil things that we do, it's all part of the plan, right? Yeah. And speaking of paths, there are many paths up the mountain. That's the second to the last tenant we have, number nine. I mean, we didn't number them, but you know. Our penultimate tenant. Yeah. Penultimate tenant. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, we talk about this a lot, but the the idea that there's no collective solution because each one of us, like I said earlier, we've all experienced our own unique journey in, in this life and we've had way different experiences. So when you tell someone you must do this and we've talked about, you know, people doing this with food. You know, you must eat this way because this is the only way that you're going to be healthy. You must not do this because it's going to cause X, Y, Z. And the funny thing is you hear all these stories sometimes of people who are like, my grandfather never smoked a day in his life and he died of lung cancer. You know, or you hear you hear a story like my grandmother smoked a pack a day every day since I knew her and, you know, died the healthiest person, you know what I mean? Lived 115 years or something, you know what I mean? So it's every person has a totally unique experience. And one thing 
does not, if one thing affecting one person does not mean it affects the other person the same exact way. So therefore you can imagine that there's no collective solution to someone's, let's say, let's call it quote, salvation, right? For a person to get to a point where they raise their consciousness and, and be better, it doesn't take the same exact thing. It will always be different for each person. So, you know, honor that, you know, understand and comprehend that each person's journey is unique and it's perfectly okay. Yeah, a hundred percent. I feel like there is no one collective solution for people to raise their consciousness, but there is one collective solution to control people's minds. You know, like <laughs> if you think about collective solutions, what are they, what are they all about? You know, it, it's, a, it's trying to harness the energy of a group of people um, so that one person or an organization at the top can use that energy for their own gains and purposes. Um, and even if it's not conscious, I feel like it's what happens. Uh, even if that purpose is to just let society go on the way it is so other people can take advantage of people. Uh, because I feel like when people go to church or whatever it is that they do, if they do like once a week or whatever, it's, it's like just enough to get them through to the next week so they can go through their life and go to work and do what they have to do. And by the time Sunday comes around, they have their salvation and they feel great. They're dancing around. And then it's just like, an, it's just like a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Where I feel like that this, all this is God, this whole thing is God's house. You can worship and praise God wherever you want. And it, it, though, again, going back to what we we're saying about praise and worship, you could be grateful. I think that would be your best praise or worship is to just be grateful about things in your life exactly. things about yourself right if you read about how jesus prayed in the bible for food and stuff he never prays in the sense of like the way people think it says he gave thanks and blah 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 right that's all he does that's gratitude giving thanks he gave thanks for the food they were about to eat and that was that's how he prayed gratitude yeah. Exactly. Gratitude is the attitude. That's yeah. a good platitude. <laughs> yeah. And no um, matter what your latitude, thing, sorry. Yeah. One more thing we want to talk about for this tenet um, was that there are many overlapping concepts from various oh. worldviews and religions. And um, so we wanted to kind of talk about how you know, no one, one is completely perfect. And, but at the same time, if that's where you're at, go for it. You know what I mean? Anyway, Brandon, you take it away. Yeah. I feel like whatever, <laughs> well, that was a good one. Whatever leads you, whatever belief system leads you to following the golden rule, I think is a, is a great start. And you have mm -hmm. the left-hand path and the right-hand path. This is something we've talked about where um, the left-hand path, I think is more of a unique journey and the right-hand path. Look is for your, that, yeah. Right. Right-hand path is more of like an organized religion type of an idea. And then there's mm -hmm. also ideas of the middle way, um, whatever way, like we were saying, right ways up the mountain you can go the right way the left way the middle way dig your own and most people might say hey well if you find a path that's the beaten path it might be easier to get to the top yeah it could be but if you take your own path and you blaze your own trail you're going to have a lot more you're going to gain a lot more knowing and understanding for yourself so i feel like that's why it Very is true. important to just go in the way that you're pulled mm-hmm if the Bible makes a lot of sense to you and is helping you, read the Bible. If the Bhagavad Gita helps you, read the Bhagavad Gita. If, if Thor and Odin and their story helps yeah. you, go there. If Gilgamesh is the one, you know, um, if Absolutely. it's just the oversharing show, hey, as long as you're not putting us on a pedestal, right? Um, yeah. If but it's I feel esoteric like, ideas. Yeah, esoteric ideas. And we've talked topics. about the difference between the esoteric and the exoteric. The exoteric is like the outer church, like the Catholic church. Um, like going to mass on Sundays and the, and the normal person, the esoteric in that example would be the inner circle. Uh, it would be people that were communicating with symbolism and that understand the symbolism in the, in the church and stuff. And who knows what they're up to. Right. 
but there is like an theosophy esoteric theosophy and Rosicrucian. Yeah, Ros- yeah, like there's, that. that's the good side of it, right? So there's a positive side to the esoteric too. Esoteric Christianity basically just means like you're living according to the path of Christ. You don't have to have any beliefs in supernatural beings or, or you know, dogmas and creeds that you're holding and stuff. Yeah, or I mean, at, or even I mean, you- I'm sure people have religified theosophy and um, Rosicrucianism. There's plenty of people who have made those into religions in themselves but they were mainly ideas um esoteric ideas that were kept in kind of a in like an inner circle like a they were kept a cult because giving it to the masses they wouldn't understand it it's like jesus did it's like the parables of jesus basically well and only a small certain uh small percentage of people would be attracted to the esoteric Absolutely. And like this idea of a cult being hidden, you can look at it as it's hidden because there's evil people that are keeping this knowledge hidden. That's but that's more of a victim status. In a, in a victor mind frame, I would say that not everybody can handle it. So only the people that come to it can handle it. And it's a throwback to our first episode, episode zero. Yeah. And furthermore, some people could get themselves hurt with this, some of these occult ideas. You know, like manifestation. If somebody learned how to manifest things before they learned that they should live in accordance with the golden rule uh, to get a better existence and to actually raise their consciousness. They could uh, manifest things and just be stuck in the materialist trap, you know, and just keep manifesting, manifesting. And not that that's bad. Maybe it'll lead them to a dark night of the soul. Maybe it'll be good for them. But I'm just saying that um, that would be a reason for people to keep things occult. But I mostly, I really think that it's because, uh, you have to have the will, the drive. And I feel like back in the day, it was harder to get this information because you'd have to be like an initiate and you'd have to be like a, a novice and a new person. You'd have to put up a lot of BS. Maybe you'd have to put up with some hazing and stuff. But I think it really is to show how much you want this knowledge. It's not just like a fleeting thing. Like, oh, I'm just going to watch a couple of videos about the occult and see how it is. It's like, no, you really want this knowledge. You have to show that you want it. So maybe they practice the true baptism. Just kidding. The baptism yeah. that Brandon and I talk about, the drowning. The yeah, they drown experience. people and you get to wake up. That's the, And that's the thing we should talk about really quick. We'll throw it in here where you can't really wake anybody up. The closest thing we found to that is like a near-death <laughs> experience. And so maybe... And again, we're not, this is a comedy. I'm a comedian, everybody. This is a comedy show. Um, We're not suggesting you do this, but if you, if somebody was having a near death experience, then maybe they could wake up to the ways that they're living and stuff like that. But um, again, we're not telling you to do that to people. Right. The one last thing I was going to say about, you know, these overlapping concepts from various world religions and views is that if you look at them all, their main idea their central main idea is about love and so it's about loving people um what is the harm in that you know that's that was the point you know? as long as you love yourself first because if you mm-hmm. just love other people and you perceive them as taking advantage of you but you're not saying anything because you're trying to people please them it goes right back to what we said before we say we say it all the time that you're gonna get mad it's going to build up and then you're going to explode right so you can't just love other people you got to love yourself first yes um and so anyway that brings us to our final tenet and again they were in no particular order we just uh kind of order of word size (laughs) yeah of the sentence size (laughs) so the final one is everything in moderation especially moderation And this speaks to balance and, you know, taking a middle path. And uh, the Tao that we've been reading is very much a very kind of balanced um, set of ideas. And uh, I'll let Brandon take it away. Well, I feel like this is really one of the most important when it comes to self-love. And it's just overlooked a lot because... If you have this philosophy of everything in moderation, especially moderation, then you're going to be okay with the times when you screw up and you don't do what you're supposed to do, or you don't get up and go to the gym that one day or whatever. You give yourself a break or a rest or 
you know, or you break plans of something you really wanted to do and then you feel bad that you can go out and do it. It's like, no, everything in moderation. Sometimes you just have to be lazy or sometimes you have to go out and party or sometimes you have to have a couple extra glasses of wine or an extra strong margarita at the, at the restaurant, you know, like, and then other times you just have to sit still and it's okay to, um, you know, to do nothing for a while. And then other times you have to be busy. So it's okay that you were really busy and you, you weren't able to be in contact with friends as much as you wanted to or something, you know, whatever it is that these little voices in your head could be telling you. And of course, I'm just speaking to myself here, everybody. Uh, yeah. Everyone has their own, their own crap that they deal with, but that's really what it is. Everything in moderation, you have that balance and you accept things for how they are and you let them, you let yourself experience different sense pleasures that you're drawn to. Even if you perceive them as negative, you kind of try it out just to see. And then you're like, Oh, maybe I shouldn't have drank those glasses of wine. Now I have a headache. I had an extra couple, mm -hmm. but it's all right. I got that experience. Now I know, now I see the world today mm -hmm. through the lens of a headache and I have to deal with that hurdle and obstacle. And now I have to be compassionate and loving toward myself and others while I have a splitting headache. There's my hurdle for right. today, you know, and that's how you right. look at it instead of saying, oh, man, I got a fucking headache. This sucks, you know? Yeah, that's what I had to do yesterday. So the last and I get it. Headaches suck. I'm not saying that I'm even capable of this. Right. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I had a couple of days. Um, we spent a couple of days at the um, the waste management, the trash open. <laughs> Oh my gosh, here in Phoenix. And um That's fucking hard. I'd never been. It was like a one uh you know, an opportunity to to do to do this. And uh Cody'd never been either. So uh we joined a friend who got his tickets thanks to Tony. Shout out to Tony Coriolis, <laughs> who joins the chat sometimes. Um and we joined him and uh yeah, we, we had a good time. But I allowed myself to get a little too dehydrated because so I didn't have, I couldn't find, I really couldn't find adequate water and I don't even know how to get water in there. So I, I maybe could have like taken some water and, you know, water bottles, but anyway, long story short, I learned a lesson and, um, I did start to get a headache because I, I think I, I got to a point where I was so thirsty and then my brother went and got me a screwdriver <laughs> and I drank that so quickly. And almost by the time I was done, I was like, I have a headache. Like I'm probably super dehydrated right now. <laughs> I was like, okay, if I ever do this again, I, I just need to find a way to make sure I have water. And I, even if, if I'm going to have a couple of drinks, just drink water. But yeah. And now you have that experience you can look back on and it, right? Instead of there's two different stories. Well, there's a few, but uh, two different stories that you could tell yourself that I can mm -hmm. think of, which would be one would be, oh, now I have a headache. This is terrible. This sucks. Or you could say, oh, all right, you know, I just had a good time. And now I have this headache and now I can use this for the future. Next time I know to bring some water or to be more whatever, you know. Yeah, find, just make a better attempt to find water. Yeah. <laughs> Not that there wasn't any, any, any water, but where I was, all they were selling was Ooh. alcoholic beverages. Plus you were in the desert. So it's not like you could just, you know, <laughs> it, it was, it was raining earlier than in the day. Oh. <laughs> it, everything was muddy and wet and yeah, people were slipping. You could see where they'd fallen into mud puddles. And stuff. Oh no. Oh, but it was, it was, a it was an experience and it was fun. I had a good yeah, time. Yeah. And that's what it's all about right now. You just have the, this different way of looking at it and everything in moderation, mm -hmm. that worldview allows you to look at it as just a learning experience. Absolutely. You don't have to be hard on yourself. You could be like, oh, I'm glad that I did this. Mm -hmm. It was cool, man. Now I know for the future. Yeah. And I'm glad that I didn't go to the Tool concert afterward because my brother was trying to get us to go. And I I was wiped out by the time we got home. 
and we didn't even get home super late you know we left don't tell joe that you could have went to a tool concert and you didn't go <laughs> yeah it was uh yeah i don't blame you who knows what could happen have been too much. but uh yeah so thanks for joining us for this uh episode or maybe two episodes we'll see we'll see how it shakes down but of you know, kind of an overview of the tenets that we uh, speak about all the time on the show. This is a, a kind of a long time coming. I've been wanting to do a show kind of like this. And Brandon thought of it the other day and I was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, we have been talking about a show with where we bring it back to like our old school tenets. And then we had that idea to come up with the 10 of them, which I think was pretty funny. And remember, everybody, you know, we're preaching to the choir here. This is we're yeah. doing this show because we're trying to absorb these tenets and we're trying to gain this worldview where, where maybe we have had a peak of it or we've opened it up. But this is what we're trying to do and expand our consciousness. So by doing this, we talk it out again and we're reminding ourselves of it. And then we're allowing you also to gain any kind of uh, knowledge or wisdom or whatever, get what you want out of it. Or maybe some people are going to hate it. And they're going to turn it off in the beginning, but that's good. We're creating vitriol for them. If you will, you know, we're uh, creating a nice little hurdle, um, but love and light, you know, we're not going to respond to any like negative, crazy comments. I usually just delete them. Um, but we do like when people ask questions, like if you have an honest question, about something that didn't make sense let us know we'll do a show about it or we'll talk about it on a future show shout out to the chat by the way thank you guys for hanging out especially here to the end of this either very long episode or pretty long two-part episode each <laughs> thanks for making it here uh we really appreciate you guys remember you can go to more laws more problems.com click on the oversharing tab there's several ways to support us if you give us 111,000 or million dollars or whatever it is you'll definitely go to heaven it's our claim we're making uh <laughs> Um, but of course the best way to support us is just hang out in the chat when we're live or when we're premiering them, like we are now, we'll be in there too. hang out with us, make sure you like the videos, share them around, comment. Like we said, let us know, give us the love, give us the feedback, whatever it is. Um, yeah, because that's ultimately why we do the show. We're just trying to raise our own consciousness and, uh, you know, it's cheaper than, taking other people's courses and again it's not sad sometimes you <laughs> take a course it's pretty cool or whatever but this is our way to do on a weekly basis uh you know for ourselves and, first for ourselves. And foremost. yeah and then also get practice at podcasting and um practice ways of expressing what we've learned and again i know i pretty much i think i said this in the beginning of the this episode or if it's the first episode of this is part two i said that expression is really and then key to this stuff when you learn it you it's a good thing i found to find a way to express it even if it's just artwork or poems or you know podcast or comedy or music whatever it is i feel like when you express it you give it into the world because this knowledge i think self-knowledge and all this knowledge it it creates a fire inside you and if you don't use that fire to forge and create something that fire could burn you on the inside. It could burn you up somehow. So yeah, get out there and express yourself in it. Again, that doesn't mean you woke great people and get fights at Thanksgiving and all that stuff. No artwork. Think of art, any type of art. That's my, that would be my quote unquote advice. If I had to give it to anybody would be to do that. Absolutely. I was going to reiterate the tenets the top 10 over yeah. tenets. if you still have it would you like to share it, your screen or oh yeah yeah i, I could a few, Oops, uh... no, i just i just put everything into a corner all right hang on yeah <laughs> i will i'll i'll bring it up now as we're uh scattered. but yeah thanks to everyone in the chat thanks for joining us uh we really do enjoy and appreciate everybody who comes in and um makes comments and has a good time with us. And um, I know some of you guys have uh, names like Blue Kachina and things like that. And uh, Dissident Jones. Those are some couple of guys, Robo Honky. 
Um, Joker's Redemption. Yeah. Daryl F. Spoons. Yeah, all you guys that come in regularly, thank you. We really do appreciate that. So here I am going to read these and as a closing. And so we have the top 10 over Sharon tenants, again, in no particular order. And they kind of look like a little, you know, mountain with, well, not quite, right? Anyway, we got be here now. The world is perfect. Do it till you're done. Fear is the mind killer. Follow the golden rule. Be a victor, not a victim. Truth needs no defense. Thou shalt not put us on a pedestal. There are many paths up the mountain. Everything in moderation, especially moderation. Yes. Amazing. So, yeah. All right, everybody. Um, shout out to everyone again. I said, like I said in the chat, everyone who's supported us. Uh, if we didn't mention your name, that doesn't mean that we don't love you. There's just uh, so many people and you know, we're just thinking of the ones that come to mind. Um, Amberson A. Cat comes to mind. Yeah, Amberson. Oh, yeah. And speaking of that, uh, what do we say to the good people, Sharon? That once you start over Sharon. Then you totally stop being a Karen. That's right. And remember, everybody, we're not trying to tell you how to live. Just maybe how to live a little more meaningfully and uh, i want to shout out amberson a cat is in the chat sometimes for giving us that idea to change it up a little i like it yeah that's right that's why you should leave comments everybody and hang out in the chat because we do listen we do uh adopt ideas that we like all right everybody until next time we'll see you later keep over sharing take care mm-hmm.